I, my name is Gerald Filson. I'm the Director of Public Affairs of the Baha'i Community. I serve on the steering committee. And I think among the several things I think the committee got right for this conference was selecting the speakers in general, but certainly the keynote speakers. John Boros yesterday, who I think will become over time one of Canada's leading public intellectuals. And when I say public intellectuals, I mean that in the very best sense of the term. And of course, the public intellectual whom everybody does know already is the speaker today. That's John Ralston Saul. Uh, I first discovered him when I landed on a book at a, it wasn't Indigo then, it was a bookstore back in 92 or 93 called, for you people of faith, excuse my language, Voltaire's Bastards, The uh, Dictatorship of Reason in the West. I loved that book. I became actually one of the promoters. I think I owe you several, uh, you owe me perhaps the number of book sales for that, for that book because I really pushed the book. It was just a terrific book. I didn't understand it all, but there was something about it that really spoke to me and I followed him since then. I haven't read all 14 of the books, but I have read three of them. And, and um, the Siamese twin one was a terrific book. Introduced me, uh, not a his history student, to, to Baldwin and Lafontaine and that whole story, which, is, which has been one of the great themes of some of his writing. But also to the fact that Canada is not a nation founded by two founding people, the English and the French, but by three. The Indian, the, the indigenous, the French, and the English. And Phil Fontaine, I heard a talk by him a few months ago, and he said one of the most effective way things we could do in this year of the sesquicentennial is if the parliament of this country would just pass a simple act. And that would just to say that there are three founding nations in this, in this that, that, that created Canada. And that would, that would already begin to have repercussions. And Douglas Anderson has mentioned that in some of his talks too but how important it would be to recognize that Canada is, as in his book, The Fair Country points out, in many ways a Métis nation. And many of you probably read an essay that he wrote a number of months ago about our immigration refugee policy and how that DNA, if you will, that is in the Canadian nation about, although we learned about the years when we weren't really accepting people, now we are, how that is a legacy and a, and a, and a result of the fact that the indigenous peoples, the First Nations people of this country, accepted refugees and immigrants back three, four, five hundred years ago and ever since. They were the welcoming party. And I think that perhaps informs something about Canada. Nobody could, I think, be more Canadian than this man. Born in Ottawa, christened in Alberta and his infancy years spent in Alberta. His childhood in Manitoba. I don't know why he missed Saskatchewan, my home province, but he had to go through Saskatchewan to get to Manitoba from Alberta. Then his high school in Ontario and his university in Quebec. And then he continued eastern and went to France and wrote his doctorate on something about the civil relations of the French military in the Algerian War or something. And we don't know in Canada, we all recognize John Ralston Saul, but we don't know that this is a man who's recognized internationally. He was the president. He was the president of Penn Canada. But he was also the president of Penn International for six years, 2009 to 2015. He's a recognized figure around, figure around the globe. 19 honorary degrees, and not just in Canada, but in Europe, some of the universities. This is a figure who I think Canadians have to cherish. And this business about being a public intellectual, in my own faith tradition, Baha'i, one of our central figures, Abdul Baha, he said that this is back during the time when our community was having trouble in Iran, he wrote to the government of Iran and he said, it is urgent that beneficial articles and books be written, clearly establishing what the present day requirements of the people are and what conduce to the happiness and advancement of peoples. And then he said that thought, the reality of human beings is thought. Now some thought leads to inaction, but some thought leads to action. <coughs> And again, in my own faith, let deeds, not words, be your adorning. This is a man who doesn't end in words. The words lead to action, and he has made leadership in civil society. He's the co-chair with his wife, the former governor general, of the institution of Canadian citizenship. And he travels endlessly as one of the great civil society leaders of our nation. So he's a public intellectual, yes, but his idea of the intellect and of thought is also very important and it's in his books and it's in that first book I read, Voltaire's Bastards, The Dictatorship of Reason. 
For him, thought or human nature is not just about reason. It must include five other elements. Memory, intuition, imagination, good plain common sense, and ethics. And those six features of what genuine human thought is about is if they're in balance and if they're integrated, then we have a human being. And I get so tired sometimes of religious people and secular people more particularly saying, oh, religion is all blind faith. No, religion is a knowledge system just like science is. Religion is a knowledge system about human relationships. It's about, it's about those elements of memory, of, of imagination, of intuition, of common sense, of ethics. And so I leave you with our keynote speaker, John Ralston Saul. Now that was a proper introduction. <laughs> That's very rare that you get a proper introduction. It's actually about the ideas. And uh, so thank you very much for that. And um, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, uh, you know, sometimes you know exactly what you're going to say. This is a more difficult group to speak to. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being a difficult group. In fact, it's a good thing to be a difficult group, I think. Um, we are, of course, on the traditional ter unceded territory of the Algonquin people, peoples. Um, and, and I really want to, you know, I really want to start there, since this is a, a group in which uh, all of you are in some way, uh, think of yourselves as spiritual, and many or most of you think of yourselves as religious. Um, it's a very interesting thing, and it's really started in the West, in the prairies, and it's spread. And now you don't have a public event, and I'm sure you probably opened with it, without some kind of acknowledgement of indigenous land. Often there's an elder who speaks, there might be uh, a cleansing with smoke. Um, and, you know, when the elders speak, you're not quite sure what they're going to say, because it may be a mixture of... Uh, of indigenous uh, pre-Christian ideas mixed with Christian ideas or other ideas. It may be a whole mixture of things. It doesn't actually, it, what's so interesting, is, and this is my point, is that in a society where none of this really was happening, and in fact the national policy had been to uh, make all of this disappear, and we went to great lengths, uh, vicious and violent lengths, uh, and constitution, not constitutional, uh, uh, legal lengths to, illegal laws, if you like, legal illegal laws, uh, to make all of this culture disappear, that suddenly, as if out of nowhere, as if out of nowhere, um, every public event in Canada be, it begins with uh, a spiritual moment. Sometimes you think, is this a religious moment, and these people don't go to church, or they don't go to the mosque, or whatever. It's, you know, they're religious elements, but it's certainly a spiritual moment, to the point where Two of the last three prime ministers insisted on their swearing-in ceremony, in which there is an inappropriate oath, uh, which needs to be changed, um, in which apparently they're not swearing allegiance to serve Canadians, um, uh, that, uh, that, that there would be an indigenous element in the swearing-in of the prime minister, either as a cleansing or being led in by an honor song and so on. This is really remarkable. And so all of this has happened, typically Canadian, has happened actually without any kind of constitutional change, without any clear intellectual debate about what is this, what's happening, and yet there's been no opposition to it. People just say, oh yeah, that seems fine. This is good. So you could, you know, if you were going to look at this in a very sort of common religious way, you know, going back to the old idea of, you know, you are one thing and what is your religion, um, you would say, well, what a victory, in a sense, even if it's the wrong religion. But in fact, what it is, is a, a, a very complex return of spirituality to the idea of public gatherings in Canada. I think that's a really interesting thing. And, I don't, and so the danger is, that, gosh, already someone's leaving, have I? <laughs> uh, um, I'm sure it's not uh, personal. Um, uh, I, I think that it, it, it showed a need, and yet people aren't quite sure what that need is. But they are more, they're reasonably comfortable with it. The danger is, of course, if people think it's a formality. Uh, 
as opposed to something of great meaning. And when I say something of great meaning, what I mean is that, that there is no such thing as a civilization without protocols, without formalities, without uh, uh, acknowledgments. And it simply doesn't exist. The idea that you can sort of just breeze into a room and, you know, gas, uh, that, that life is like, uh, you know, an email without a, a dear so-and-so and, a, and, a, and something at the end and paragraphs, that life is just a vague sort of, you know, kind of communication we all feel good about. It just isn't true. I mean, that is not actually how civilizations function. They have protocols, because without the protocols, you're actually insulting people in the audience. You're assuming that everybody's in agreement when in fact you have not re-examined what the assumptions are of the society. And if you haven't re-examined them, it may be that you're simply carrying forward old habits of racism, old habits of uh, uh, certain religions count and other religions don't, that you haven't actually thought your way through. Uh, how are we all sitting down together? What is our relationship to each other? What's our relationship to place? to the place where we are. What have we got wrong? What are we willing to change? So I think that return of spirituality is incredibly important and needs to be talked about and thought about in order to not to formalize it. I think it's actually the slightly surprising side of it. You actually never quite know what's going to happen is good. And, it, and that, that people can actually make it different depending on where they are and who's speaking and what their experiences are. I think that's great, providing they understand that, and I've always seen it, they understand that somehow they're speaking for everybody. Um, I think that there's a, a second part to it which is incredibly important, which is that, that when somebody stands up and says that they acknowledge they're on, and then the unceded territory of other various other forms, um, nobody quite knows what that means. And what we do know that it means, if we think about it, is that this is a um, profound rejection of both civil codes and common law. Profound rejection. Because, you, and I could take any other European law, but those are the two that we supposedly adopted, although we've radically changed them. And I remember speaking with members of the Supreme Court about did indigenous law have an effect on uh, 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 Canadian law, which we describe either as civil law, uh, common law, and then, of course, w once you get to any kind of national law or Supreme Court, somehow those two have to be mixed, right? Even though we never talk about how they're mixed. It's one of the great uh, uh, challenges for the Supreme Court is how to make those two legal systems go together. But in fact, they were already made to go together over a 500-year period of uh, the first, say, two to 300 of which uh, uh, the Christians, because it was largely the Christians of various backgrounds, not a, a lot of them religious minorities, which is often forgotten, um, they, in order to do well and be accepted and be included, in fact changed many of their spiritual and ethical and day-to-day -day ways to um, work with the dominant people of this uh, land, which were, who were the indigenous people. So that, in fact, this mixing of the legal systems has been going on for centuries. It's just our, our law schools don't teach any of that because they're in total colonial denial. And uh, they go on teaching, oh, we only do civil code here. Oh, we only do common law here. And a few do both, and none of them actually talk about the indigenous impacts on uh, law in the country. But clearly, by saying you're on the unceded territory, if it's more than a politeness, which it is, what you're actually saying is that the European assumptions about property and ownership do not entirely apply, even if we're not sure how they don't apply. So the, the idea that, so this is, if I were to take one step further, this is a profound rejection of Plato, of the dominance of the human being over the place. You know, which is at the center of the European philosophy, which is taught in all our Europe, our Canadian universities, as if we just got off the boat, 100% of us yesterday, and we're very, very lucky to be able to footnote something said a couple hundred years ago by European philosopher. That's what they teach in our philosophy departments. I'm sorry, that's what they do. Uh, you know, they won't even allow Harold Innes, 
and Marshall McLuhan in, let alone indigenous philosophy. You know, I mean, uh, it, it, it's actually one of the most astonishing things that we actually run universities as if philosophy means people think in Europe. We don't think here. We don't have anybody in those, uh, in the texts of profound ideas in those departments because we don't think, we've been here 500 years or thousands of years, but we don't think. We do footnotes for the Europeans who think, right? That's what we do. So there's a fundamental problem in, in terms of ideas of spirituality, ideas of belonging. But my point is that, that it, it, this is the begin when we say we're on unceded territory, it is the beginning of a very interesting conversation about a different relationship between human beings and land. And at the heart of that other possible relationship is a concept of spirituality, which is a concept that human beings are not above in the Platonist way, which is what the Abrahamic religions picked up, let's face it, uh, but the people are in the land. And I remember when I did, um, I don't remember if it was Siamese twins, but you know, and, and I was sort of looking at, well, what could I say about um, what was then called animism? We were talking like 10, 15 years ago, it, that, that particularly, you know, white people from Western Europe and their descendants, you know, are you, are you talking to rocks, that kind of put down. In order to avoid having a conversation about the fundamental possibility that actually you don't get 100% ownership of land by buying and selling. That something much more profound is going on, which is you have a complicated relationship with place because you're part of the place, not above the place. And that when one talks about spirituality, that's a large part of what we're talking about, which is that, that, that it is not an entirely rational process. It is a far more complicated process in which we're in it not above it and giving orders uh, to it. And that with that, with that kind of spirituality comes enormous responsibility uh, to understand what our limitations are, our limitations of ownership, our obligations to act in a certain way as part of the place, and to act beyond self-interest, not out of charity. See, I mean, what I'm trying to say here is, is you know, it, you don't, and I say you don't realize, I don't realize, none of us realize the extent to which even when you're all getting together and you're all spiritual and you're from different religions and you think because you're together and you, you, know, you, you know how to get on and you're doing some good things that, that we've somehow fundamentally changed the society. And what I'm saying is that we're, we're creeping in the darkness because so much of what we allow to remain in place is a fundamental rejection of everything you're probably trying to stand for. And, um, uh, and, you know, and part of that is the, the, the whole idea that our relationship to land, that it, we're being charitable by not misusing the land. That our, our civil society organizations, of which there are now, you know, millions and millions of millions of people involved in including religious organizations, that somehow we're all, they're all legally charities. They're legally charities. I mean, this is a piece of garbage, right? I mean, they're not charities. They're not, you know, rich people who come out of their church or mosque or whatever. And, and you know, the tithing is actually quite an interesting idea because that's a more sophisticated idea than than raw charity. It's a far more sophisticated idea, actually. But this sort of idea that the goodness of our heart we're going to give, that's what a charity is. Well, so maybe there is some charity. But actually, the fundamental idea of the civil societies is that it isn't about self-interest. It is about engaged citizenship. It is about an idea of belonging and sharing. It is an idea about the other. And you know, you won't actually get there None of us will actually get there. I say this having run and you know, been the president of an, uh, the oldest modern civil society organization, Penn, that we won't actually get there until we do things like change the laws that say that, uh, that uh, the, the laws about giving are, are regulated on principles, i.e. rules, set largely in the 18th and 19th century in Europe in order to regulate you know, Abrahamic religion's approach towards rich people doing good for poor people. 
See, that's the fundamental. You see, you have to actually change that if civil society is going to play an important role in the society without being sort of misrepresented as mere charity. Mere charity, which doesn't mean charity isn't worth doing as well. And, and I'm, so, just a couple, that was a couple of introductory remarks on the opening line. You know, so I could keep you here for days by trying to just take you through what, where we are and what we need to do and how we need to go about it. And I, I want to make a second very local introductory remark, which is, so we are on the unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. And as those of you who live in Ottawa will know, how many of you are from Ottawa? Oh, quite a few of you. We'll know that th this capital was specifically chosen not by the Queen of England, a total lie which for some reason the city of Ottawa continues to <laughs> propagate, was totally uh, chosen by the Parliament of Canada uh, under the very careful leadership of John MacDonald and, and, and Georgia Chien Cartier with the support of the Governor General. And then they did, they couldn't get anybody to agree. They tried everything under the sun, including pretending that the Queen had told them to do it. That's that. It's a lie. Uh, they got her, they, they used responsible government as a methodology to get her to sign a piece of paper that said that she thought it ought to be Ottawa. And they, they thought that ought to do it. And the Governor General was actually sent to London to tell the British government to tell her to sign the piece of paper. And then they brought it back and gave it to Parliament. And Parliament said, well, we don't care what she says. And they voted it down again. So in fact, uh, MacDonald resigned and Cartier took over and he went out and did a good old Canadian thing, which was spent some money <laughs> in certain ridings and got the votes and Ottawa was chosen. But the point is that Ottawa was chosen for very, very good reasons and is the natural capital because of you know, distance from the border, uh, military reasons, economic uh, transportation reasons, um, the linkage between Francophone and Anglophone, a whole series of reasons. But uh, what was not talked about was that, of course, that Ottawa was an incredibly important meeting place of indigenous peoples. It had long been one of the most important capitals. You know, I'm mixing old ways of talking and new ways of talking. Uh, one of the most important capitals um, in the northern half of North America because of the Ottawa River and the other rivers come together in the Chaudière Falls and that the road to the interior of the continent was Ottawa. This was one of the major stopping places. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's that famous Champlain statue up on the hill, right, uh, uh, that you all know in Ottawa, where he's pointing, I guess, upriver. And of course, in, in romantic 19th century imperial terms, he's saying, that way, boys. Whereas, in fact, what he's actually saying to the assembled Wyandots around him is, where the hell are we going? You know, I mean, so it's a very, this is a very important place. And as we all know, that the, there are several stepping stones, and those stepping stones are largely spiritual as, and physical, not political, right? And the Chaudière Falls is one of the most important spiritual, physical sites in Canada. And uh, we all know, uh, even in European memory terms, that whenever anybody went into the center of the continent, they stopped at Chaudière Falls and there was a spiritual ceremony involving tobacco and so on. Sh um, Champlain marks that. And it went on to people writing about it in the early 20th century. Even after the area had been taken over by industry and sort of deformed, still when people canoed up or went up the river in smaller boats, they stopped at Chaudière Falls and went through at least the formality of the ceremony. So I, I say all, and I, I think about all of that because it was William Commander. Some of you may have met him. Uh, somebody who, if he were alive today, could be here, one of the great elders, the great Algonquin elder, one of the great thinkers of Canada, a really tough cookie, uh, fabulous guy. And I remember him, t when we first came to Ottawa, taking me through the whole thing about what needed to happen on the islands, how the islands were, were the place that where logically one would insert, reinsert indigenous peoples into the core of the national capital because it had been the sacred circle of the national capital. We know has a, sit, a, a primary sacred circle, which is the Algonquin uh, First Nations sacred circle. And the heart of that sacredness is Chaudière Falls, right? And um, 
And, and so this is like, I just this is my last comment on how we're not thinking about what we're doing. So everybody in Ottawa, I don't know if that includes you, is just so absolutely thrilled that after these being abandoned by the second wave of industrialization, we, they've, they've come up with this brilliant idea to raise some, some municipal taxes and get it cleaned up by building condos there. <laughs> a wall of condos. A wall of condos on one of the most sacred sites in Canada. So it's actually an aberration vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous sacred circle, and it's an aberration vis-a-vis -vis the Canadian sacred circle, which is, you know, Parliament, uh, the Supreme Court, the archives, the museum, the war museum, uh, going the other way, uh, the, war, uh, the war memorial, uh, Shadow Warrior, I suppose, uh, the, the, the National Gallery, the, the Museum of History. So this is this great sacred circle. And they've agreed in order for, for a mess of pottage to build a wall of condos within the sacred circle. This is exactly the equivalent of building a wall of condos across the mall in Washington. Exactly the same. And what they're selling the condos, they haven't been allowed to do it yet, saying is you will get a private uh, view of parliament. So it's, it's also deeply ethically corrupt. Because the idea that certain people with money would be allowed to own a private view of Canadian democracy is a statement of sort of lobbying, of a most astonishing statement of lobbying I've ever heard. And of course, it's not even good economics because the fact is that all the city will get out of it is some annual taxes, which is a tiny amount of money compared to what they would get if this were developed as a, a remarkable park with the Chaudier Falls return to their spiritual origins, uh, with indigenous people, I, I, uh, curators, if you like, or uh, running this. It would be bringing millions of more people to Ottawa. For, I mean, you would be holding this meeting probably in a kind of gathering place on those islands. That's where people would be gathering. And there would be ceremonies whenever foreign visitors came at the Chaudière Falls. An enormously important thing for Ottawa to make us whole again, to make sense of the, the Ottawa being the true natural capital of the country, and to make sense of the spirituality of the place. Now, so I, second introductory comment. I could do my whole speech as I love doing the introductions. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say to you is that that the, the essence of, of spirituality and belonging and sharing and understanding the triangular foundation of the country is tied to actions. And those actions are, very, are thousands, have roots thousands of years old. There, is, there isn't a single important city in Canada, with the exception of probably Regina, which is every other city in Canada is built where there was an important indigenous spiritual gathering place. Every single one of them. Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria. You just go through them. They were the best spots. That's one reason. And they were spiritual spots. And see, that's part of a discussion that the reality of, of uh, belonging, of spirituality, of understanding here. So why are we having difficulty talking about this? Well, part of it is, as I said, that in spite of the fact that we're doing much better than we were, we continue in our universities and in our discourse, whether it's legal or political or who we quote, we continue to act as if what's happening here is just a little outcropping of what happened in Europe. And, and so there's a, the secular debate is really just a kind of rollout of a European secular debate. It's not particularly interesting, I and mean, there's very little admission of the fact that it that the secular debate in Europe was part of a battle between uh, largely the Catholic Church and uh, uh, who had far too much power and far too much land and far too much money and didn't believe in democracy or freedom of expression and so on, and, and the reform movement. And, in, you know, in, and the heart of that secular argument was France in 1903 or 1905. They took the big step and they rightly took away the money and the power of the uh, Catholic religious orders and put in place a secular education system. So I understand entirely why they did what they did at a particular time, but this is not a theory. This is a political battle 
which ended with the right people basically winning. And they went too far, but in a way they were responding to the fact that the other side had gone too far for centuries. So it was a real political battle of black and white, of yin and yang, of, you know, it was Manichaeism. And the idea that 110 years later uh, around the world, we're all supposed to organize ourselves on the basis of a particular fight that took place in France between the French Revolution in 1905 is really not very interesting to me. This is not a solution for uh, anything. It's, this, is, this is a kind of subterranean dominance of secular ideology as if the only other option was a return to the dominance of religions. And there's nothing in between. I mean, this is real Manichaeism. You got these two extremes, both of them really out of date, unless you're an extremist. And then this enormous territory in the middle where we all live is, is not allowed um, anything very interesting in terms of organization or structure. So I obviously do not, I shouldn't say, I do not see religion, uh, formal religion, at the center of the democratic process in Canada. I mean, I don't think that's the way to go. I don't think that's what we should be doing. I don't think that's what Canadian people want. Uh, it, for a whole bunch of reasons, one of which, how the hell would you do it? You know, it's just so complicated. And, and, and I think also we have to be very, very careful that we don't, again, slip down the most imitative European country left in the world, which is the United States, which is completely structured on 18th century Enlightenment uh, uh, theory followed by 19th century European nationalist ugliness, you know, the linkage of slavery not, being not a, a minor part of that. We always have to remember that the people who actually benefited from slavery in Brazil and the United States that were England and France. They were the two big financial beneficiaries because it was their factories that benefited, it was their ships that benefited, and so on. So the, the idea that it was American slavery and that the British did away with slavery is such nonsense. It was the British who actually drove slavery, and the French drove slavery, and others sort of went along for the ride, and the Americans were the horror, at, and the Brazilians were the horror at the kind of core of it, if you like. But, but uh, uh, my point is that, that we have this enormous space and there is a role for spirituality, and there has to be an acceptance, and I think there is in Canada, of the reality, which is that we all know that people come to the public place with conscious or unconscious levels of religion and, and or spirituality, and that we have never done well in Canada by trying to deny that. There's nothing to be denied there. The Fathers of Confederation were you know, they had many flaws, but actually when you read about them, they're far more interesting than history presented them because um, they were uh, men of the book. You now they were Protestants and Catholics and Anglicans and so on, um, to the exclusion of others, but they were men of the book and they knew the Bible backwards and forwards. And in, they put together a large part of the concept of the country against the British. Remember that, this is the first country to talk its way out of an empire in the history of the world without having to lift a gun. Because we tried lifting guns and it didn't work. So, you know, between sort of 1830, 40 and, uh, and, and 1931, we gradually talked our way out of the biggest empire since the Roman Empire. We outsmarted them in debate, after debate, after debate. And a great deal of that was done by using Abrahamic texts. And, you know, and that is a really interesting thing. I've tried to write about that in, in, um, uh, Siamese, tw in Siamese Twins, yeah. And, and that is not looked at enough because people are afraid to talk about how they took some of the most interesting, they, they based a large part of the building of confederation on a psalm, which is considered by all uh, uh, religious experts to be the most left-wing the most egalitarian, the most obliged to help people, Psalm. And now you're gonna ask me which number, and I of course can't remember, because I don't remember numbers, but it's, hmm? you remember. Which is the number? Yeah, is, I think it's 72, I think that's right. It was, a, you know, and nobody wanted to talk about the fact that these funny old guys, and they weren't actually very old, chose Psalm 72 as the basis for the construction of the country, which was the Psalm which talks about egalitarianism and inclusion and obligation, uh, and so on. Anyway, so it's always been with us, 
but it, it and, and, and I think what's fascinating is today with, you know, uh, uh, Baha'i, uh, uh, Islam, Hinduism, and, so, and the return of the whole spiritual uh, movement of indigenous peoples, we have the opportunity to have a fascinating conversation. And, but that fascinating conversation has to be seen in the context of what remains in the formal structures of the country which are getting in the way of what you might call inclusion and justice and belonging and imagining the other. So this is quite different from, you know, a bunch of people from different religions getting together. This is a much more profound uh, thing which we have to somehow uh, face. And, um, and, and part of it, I think the first stage, is to really say to ourselves, we have to change our universities. They're stuck in Europe. They're stuck in the models of the 18th and 19th century. Uh, we're, we're not asking ourselves serious questions about where are we, what are our obligations? How do we belong here? How are we going to live with each other? There is nothing, you know, uh, you, when introducing me, you, you talked a little bit about this, and I, I wrote about this in a Fair Country. There is nothing in French, German, or a British philosophy. Um, there might be something in Erasmus or Vico, but maybe. There is nothing in what we call modern philosophy which would suggest the possibility of the existence of a place like Canada that all of those philosophy, philosophies are based on an assumption that, we are, that, a, that a nation state is a Westphalian, even if it didn't yet quite exist in some cases, a Westphalian model of the nation state, which is essentially a nation state in which there is one dominant religion, one dominant race, one dominant language, one dominant mythology, and if you could really get your act together, you can kill or ban anybody else who is in line with you in order to create this monolithic dream of the, the, the mono-race, mono-religion, mono-mythology, uh, mono-language society. And so one of the reasons that Canadians have had a great deal of difficulty explaining what we're doing here is because we're teaching ourselves all this European stuff in the universities. Our, our, our politicians are endlessly making references to European roots, and yet those things would lead us in the opposite direction to the direction we've been going in from the beginning at our best. Through indigenous influences, through religious minority influences, through living with complexity, through never having been a mono-race, mono-religion, mono-language society. Having always been a society of overlapping loyalties, overlapping identities, overlapping religions, overlapping languages. It's a different model. It's an intentional, fascinating model. We're not alone in the world, but it's a fascinating possibility. But we won't get there if we stay stuck in ways of, of, of talking about it which are essentially coming out of a tradition designed to eliminate difference. Do you see what I mean? This is, it's a really fundamental problem that which I don't think we have really faced. In a sense, the four books I've written about Canada are entirely about trying to show that the language is here. The language has existed, indigenous language, but also settler language, which was all about the possibility of living with complexity intentionally, not accidentally. Not, oh, well, we don't know what else to do. Or oh, we're not really a country because we can't define ourselves in a single line. Well, that idea that you can define yourself in a single line, that European-American idea, that's what leads to the violence. That's what leads to the necessity to eliminate the other, the differences. It's the complexity which allows us to produce something which is now, let's face it, the oldest continuous democratic federation in the world. We are the oldest continuous democratic federation in the world. And we're the first, second, or third oldest continuous democracy in the world. That's another discussion. I'm willing to argue us for number one, but I don't need to. I would settle for number two or three. But the point is that idea that we've actually worked our way carefully through this intentionally, sometimes accidentally, and sometimes with some moments of horror, which the churches, the, the Abrahamic churches, two of them, uh, were uh, particularly involved in, uh, residential schools and so on. Um, uh, but we, we've had these very low moments, you know, what was done to the Chinese, what was done to the Japanese, continuing racism uh, and so on. But nevertheless, the main line is we've worked our way through this model of complexity and I think that is really uh, 
really interesting. And I think that spirituality has a major role to play in saying, no, no, complexity is not a bad thing. We do not carry messages of simplicity or Manichaean messages. We carry messages of enormous complexity. And meeting, one of the reasons I accepted this invitation is because I believe that a gathering around spirituality is a gathering around the idea that complexity it can be an intentional act. And that, for me, is very, very important. And to pretend that that is not so, that you, know, you can't run a country with that kind of idea of spiritual complexity is an invitation to uh, a very big problem. Um, I think at the same time, I do want to say that, uh, having said I don't think you put religion at the core of things, I also think you want to beware, although it's very awkward for many people who preach, um, you want to beware of the idea also the, 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 of the fixed, the possibility of the fixed nature of religions. I mean, the history of all religions, uh, including the Abrahamic religions, is that they come into being in controversy, that they are filled with differences of opinion. There are always different sects within them. And uh, it's only the Manichaean which makes one believe that this problem can be solved. And that, that, that willingness to live, after all, you know, the reality of being a preacher, and I think I see some of you probably are, priests or uh, mullahs or uh, rabbis, um, is that, you know, you, that in one way, you're not, you're not speaking for God. Um, I know enough about, I've read enough. I mean, uh, you're really leaders of the debate inside the religions. And, you know, uh, you're not getting orders about what to say. You may be inspired or not, but you're part of that debate. And that debate is the spiritual essence of the religions, in my view. That, uh, that uh, acceptance of the idea that you have to get up every Friday, every Saturday, every Sunday. When, what do Baha'is do? I don't know. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or four times a day or whatever it is. And, and, and you get up and you start again. You start the debate again. What did this actually mean? What did Allah mean? What did God mean? What did, you know, and you just go through it. What does it mean? What is the meaning of? And so, for example, I think one has to be very careful about attempts to protect religions from that kind of debate and controversy. Um, for example, there's a movement um, which is not entirely from extremists in Islam, and there are other extremists uh, in Christianity who are a part of it as well, uh, to, to introduce into the international ideas of, um, of, of um, human rights uh, a, a, a right to be protected against religious defamation. There's a whole movement that takes place and there's a fight going on at the European court over this. This is a disastrous idea. The idea that, that, that religion could be brought under the umbrella of defamation and that therefore people who attack religion, any religion, uh, could be counterattacked under the laws for defaming the religion. And that's just not what religion is. Religion is far more important than any of that. It's far more essential than any of that. It, it's beyond any of that. And it has to be, therefore, open to the uh, need to have a thick skin when it comes to what people are going to believe and not believe. And I, and I was just reading, I, I read, actually, I'm not a big expert in the Quran, but I reread and reread the Quran I have for ever since I wrote a novel in the 80s. And the Quran is probably one of the richest uh, sacred texts when it comes to the importance of debate, the importance of inclusion, the importance of belonging, the importance of respecting the other. It's far more clear about this than the New Testament certainly is. Far clearer. I mean, uh, um, when you look, it's, in fact, uh, um, it's the only, as far as I know, the only uh, one of the Abrahamic texts where, uh, where uh, God, Allah, is actually quoted as saying that I made you different on purpose. So, and, I'm, and, it, and it's a test to see how much good you can do. You're in a competition with each other. I don't know if there are any uh, preachers who agree or disagree with my interpretation of this, but I've, it, I've read several uh, uh, translations of it, and they all come out to the same thing, which is basically that Allah is saying, you're all different, but you know, I'm testing you on how good you are. 
and, can, and in its essence, can you live together? And this is, this is very important that it's in the Koran which this is so clearly uh, said. And I think it actually also goes along with, um, I'll come back to it in a minute, to, with, to something else. So you've heard that you know, I've written about Canada as a Métis civilization. And, I, and it, this is an interesting co idea of complexity. So some people say, well, are you, you know, are, aren't you invading the territory of the Métis people, the Métis nation? Aren't you sort of you know, watering it all down? And the answer is absolutely not. What I'm saying is that the, the Métis nation is an astonishing living example of an organized culture based on complexity, not the elimination of complexity. That is really interesting. Now you could go back and you know, figure out who slept with whom and where did the children come from, and you know. But that's that's all fun and interesting. But the actual point is that you have a very long-established, fascinating, rich nation, culture, people who are, at their very heart, the exact opposite of the Western European idea that uh, the definition of a nation of a people is somehow that if you could just do a blood analysis, you know, they would all be the same. Whereas the concept, the Beatty thing is, well, no, this is very, very complicated. And so in a way, they are the model for what's best about Canada. Now, they're formal, they have a legal status and all the rest of it, and I'm enormously admirative of, of what they've done and are doing. But they are, in a way, a model for what we're all trying to do elsewhere in the country, which is to figure out how do we create complexity? How do we live with complexity? And so that's why in my book, you know, the Métis people is capital M and, and the Métis, uh, uh, you know, civilization of Canada is a small M. But it's an idea of complexity. And I think Canadians instinctively understand that, which is um, a, wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, and it is, I think, a model for all of us when we're trying to think, is it possible to have a civilization intentionally based on complexity? And at the heart of that, I do believe that spirituality plays a role. And it's particularly interesting, of course, because the Métis Nation had at the heart of it indigenous spirituality, Catholicism, and Anglicanism. So right from the beginning, it had this necessity to deal with three different groups who in Europe would have put at each other's throat killing each other, right? So there's something very, very um, interesting there. And it shows that we don't have to go down the road of the Westphalian nation state and its monolithic view of how things uh, function. And it shows that we need to be very actively rethinking how we do things in our universities, how we teach in our universities, how is, how is philosophy taught? Um, how's literature taught? I mean, we're still teaching literature on a European-based linguistic structure. You want to do English literature, go to the English literature department. I mean, how many people even think about this? Want to do French? Let's go to the French department. Okay, so you're doing Quebec literature. Okay, you go in the French department. Oh, you're doing, uh, you're doing Margaret Atwood. You go, in, or uh, Michael Adachi, or, or Alice Munro, you know, the great Alice Munro. You go into the English department. How do you teach English? Well, it starts in England. And we're a footnote. Oh, well, yeah, over there, Quebec literature, you know, uh, it, it starts in Paris. So you've started in your universities teaching literature as if the possibility of Canada does not exist. You cannot have a country in which there are literatures in those two languages living together, not side by side, together, intermingling in various ways. And of course, you've in addition, completely eliminated, very happily from that point of view, uh, indigenous concepts. I mean, if you ask me what's the greatest poetry ever written in Canada, well, the great, greatest poetry I've read are the West Coast uh, First Nations myths, which are the equivalent of the Odyssey or the Iliad, and which are just amazing things. And of course, they're not in any Canadian anthologies of poetry um, because they're written in Haida, you know, there are translations, but they're not Canadian. They're in Haida. Funny, I thought Haida came out of this territory, right? You know, whereas English and French didn't. And, you know, the greatest anti-war poetry, as I mentioned just before, and the greatest anti-war poetry, in my opinion, written in this country, was written by Stephen Gay Stephenson, a farmer in southern, in, uh, near Red Deer in Alberta in the early 20th century, you know, about half the population of Iceland uh, 
came to Canada and the United States, and Canada is really the alternate capital of Iceland, I mean, or uh, Manitoba. And um, their, great, their first great, they would say, modern poet is Stephen Gay Stevenson, who would stop milking the cows whenever he had a poetic idea. He's a very important guy. I remember being we were on a state visit there. We're out in the country somewhere with the Minister of Education, and I, they're very good at poetry. And I said, there were speeches, and I said, now, Minister, surely you could recite a poem. And immediately he jumped up and recited a long poem by Stephen Gay Stevenson. Stephen Gay Stevenson is not in a single one of the anthologies of Canadian poetry because he wrote it in Icelandic. You know? Well, he was very lucky because he wrote anti-war poetry during the First World War, and had the police, RCMP, been able to read it, he'd have been in prison. But, you know, he's a great, great Canadian poet. So what I'm saying is we have to break up these European models of how we learn and teach, because they actually fundamentally go against everything we've been trying to do on the positive side for 500 years. They actually reflect everything negative about what's happened here over the last 500 years, because they reflect that monolithic European model. Um, uh, I think the quote, just I was looking for it, I had it written down here. The quote from the Koran is something like, had God willed, he would have made you a single community, and it goes on from there. And it's a fabulous paragraph. It's a fab, I mean, you know, we could put that up, that paragraph in the Koran, uh, put it in our constitution, and it would, or in our, our, our immigration laws, it would express uh, largely what we've been trying to do for 500 years at our best, as opposed to at, at our horrible moments. And then I think it's also, I would say, from, from, from Islam, a very, very interesting agreement, which is 650 around there. It's before the revelation, so when is that? It's, it's, it's called um, Hilf al-Fudul. Yeah. Well, when, was, when is that about? Is it that early? 590? You know, and so here's this agreement. You know, it's like anything out of the past. It happened in a smaller population, and, you know, and, but it, 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 it was essentially that people from outside came to, what's the town? Mecca. It, it was Mecca, was it? And uh, they were improperly treated commercially, but actually humanly, uh, because they were outsiders, and, and then a group of the citizens got together and said, this just is impossible, and they came up with an agreement this is the agreement, which is, could be called the League of Virtue. It's one of the translations of it. And the idea was that all good people belong together, that all good people must protect all good people. And after the revelations, the prophet made a specific point of saying that even though he'd signed it before the revelations, he stood by it. You know? And again, I, you know, there's some of that, obviously, in the New Testament. Um, there's some of that in the Old Testament. There's some of that in every religious text. I'm sure if we went around and uh, uh, Baha'is or the, the Sikhs or the Hindus, there's always something like that. But this is so clear and so modern because it's on the one hand a, a humanist agreement, on the other hand a legal agreement. And you have a clear buy-in from the people who would actually organize the society. So I mean, these things exist. They're very relevant to us. And I think they should play a bigger role uh, in the conversations that we have among ourselves. And so what I'm actually saying here is that, that we have a base which is coming back, which is the indigenous ideas of spirituality, which put people in the land. I think this is incredibly important because it gets us out of the trap, the, the Platonist trap. I mean, if you want to know why we're not getting anywhere in the fight against global warming, because we're not, I mean, the Paris victory is not a victory, it's a, a little creep. And it looks good because there was no movement at all, but it's tiny and it's, it's utilitarian. It, why are we moving so slowly? The reason we're moving so slowly is because Plato and the Abrahamic religions, so that's all three, and uh, Western civilization bought into the idea that human beings are on top and we get to order the earth. And that is, you know, it worked in some ways and gave us some advantages, but that is the long-term disaster. We cannot imagine how we could be reduced to merely being one of the players inside nature, with nature. And indigenous philosophy, spirituality, religion has at its heart that idea. So a guy like Richard Atlio, who's one of the greatest philosophers in Canada, 
uh, who'd be about my age and who wrote books, two books called Tsawak. Uh, the second volume is a masterpiece. He's a, a hereditary chief of the uh, Hausit people, which is near Claycote Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, but he's not alone. Um, you know, have very carefully explained how this functions. And these, these philosophical spiritual ideas dominated the northern half of the continent for millennia, uh, were, were central to the relationship between the newcomers, the settlers, and the indigenous people for at least 250 to 300 years, then were you know, scrapped by people like me, and I do mean people like me, because I've got Northern Irish origins, and we were the worst, uh, by far. Right? I, mean, I don't know how many of you are out of the Northern Irish group, but we have n not a happy history. We're the single most dangerous group in terms of Canadian immigration were the Northern Irish, because with the Orange Order, we threatened the Canadian idea of complexity for over a century. We led violence in the street. We had thugs, mobs of thugs. We tried to, to win elections through violence. Uh, it was an appalling organization. And we've sort of settled down, and we've contributed some good things. Um, but it, if you're actually going to pick out a group of immigrants to Canada who threatened the Canadian model from over 500 years, it was the Northern Irish Protestants and, and, and the Orange Order, which was there. Now, it also did things like, you know, if you wanted a job, you joined the Orange Order because they could get you a job, and that's a large part of immigration to Canada has been that kind of ethnic groups helping each other get jobs in whatever area they dominated. But um, uh, I think that, you know, what is astonishing is that today um, the indigenous spiritual philosophy which was dominant, then thought old-fashioned compared to European modernism and American modernism, and then banned, banned, right? Very actively banned by Canadian law, is back. And you look at it now, if you actually look at it and read some of the books, I mean, you read uh, Taiyaki Alfred, you read all, all these wonderful young or older philosophers, and you suddenly realize it's postmodern. It's exactly where we need to be. If we were following the theories of indigenous uh, spirituality and philosophy, we would have moved much, much faster on global warming issues, for example, because it reorients the concepts of self-interest and human domination and isolated rationality, and it, it doesn't do away with them. It puts them in a completely different context. And I think that is something that we just have not really addressed. And, no. It's getting easier to address because more and there are more and more, if you like, uh, indigenous philosophers who are at the same time loyal to their indigenous ideas and interpreting them in English and French and in, you know, in books which anybody can read. They're sort of offering them up to us. So let me, um, uh, but, but we at the same time still have the Indian Act we still have many rules which are based on European ideas of race, on measurements of blood. Are you actually, you know, legally an Indian? Uh, can you prove it through marriage, in other words, through blood? We're still living with all sorts of leftovers which no amount of goodwill can change unless you actually change the fundamental rules because the fundamental rules were put in place precisely in order to establish the superiority of English people. Not even Scots, which is sort of interesting because <laughs> there's more Scots here than English. It was really an English idea. It came, it's social Darwinism. It's the measurement of blood. It's racism. It was specifically put in place. And we have not specifically removed it, even though the Supreme Court has specifically re removed it. But the government of Canada and the governments of the provinces have not changed the, way, the laws and the way they do things sufficiently for that to be the case. And really, it's very interesting that today you could argue that the civil services, controlled by theoretically by politicians of the government of Canada and the provinces, are still disobeying the Supreme Court. Because the Supreme Court, in a series of rulings over the last 30 years, has made it perfectly clear that none of this stuff is allowable. But, but the, the Indian Affairs, which is what it really is in its mind, continues to act, you know, it's, it's, 
it looks nicer, it sounds nicer, but fundamentally it has not changed. And fundamentally the Justice Department specialized in indigenous affairs has not changed. You're still spending, and I am, $125 million a year in the courts of Canada to pay for the Justice Department of Canada to fight against justice for indigenous people. That's what's happening. And I've had that conversation with them. Oh, we're not initiating cases anymore. Yeah, but they're, they're suing you, and the reason they're suing you is for very good reason, and you're fighting back, as opposed to settling. They're still, in, by very clever means, still attempting to do away co with concepts of sovereignty, even though Chilcotin, the Supreme Court decision, has made it perfectly clear that this is not acceptable. And the Pays des Braves agreement in Quebec, it, early in this century, made it even clearer uh, that it was not only possible but doable and would do no harm. So we, we have a lot of work to do in terms of rethinking the fundamentals of our ethical uh, position. Uh, so last comments. Um, I say all this in the context of we're an immigrant country. Uh, Eighty-six percent of immigrants to Canada become citizens within five years. It's just so you understand, the number, equivalent number in the United States is 40 percent, less than half of ours, and in Europe it's probably 10 percent. So does that mean we're flawless? No. Does it mean we still have racism? Yes. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it, this is a, a road we're going down, a very interesting road, and it really does have its roots, in my opinion, in the way in which indigenous peoples through their spirituality and their idea of their relationship to place, welcomed the newcomers. Once they decided that we weren't the enemy, they, and there's, there are thousands of texts that are published about this, going back to the, the, the 1700s. I said, well, since you're here and we're not going to kill you, we have to somehow welcome you into our family and into our communities, into our circle. Uh, here there are a couple of rules, but once we've got you in the circle, we'll figure out the rest of it. Does that sound like Canadian immigration policy? You know, and you can't find that in the concepts of Europe or the United States. The melting pot is a pure Westphalian idea. You come here and you melt. You lose everything and you become one. That's the oneness of the Westphalian model, the refusal to live with complexity. Of course, the reality is the United States is a really interesting country and they do live with complexity. Their problem is that they, do, they don't legally or mythologically have an ability to accept that they're doing that. And that's, if you look for the drama in that society, the drama in that society is that the language has nothing to do with the reality of the country. And they don't know how to get at that. We're further along because we don't actually have any good language that we're using. And so we're able to do things without blocking ourselves all the time. And when we've blocked ourselves in this past, it is, as I said before, because we've allowed English, French, American ideas to come in and tell us, those Japanese, you better do something about them. And we fall for it, and we do it. We take full responsibility for our own racism, our own exclusion, but it is not the dominant theme of the place and doesn't need to be because it isn't actually in our founding texts, our founding ideas, or the way we relate um, to each other. So that whole idea that the Europeans discovered when they came here, that idea of being included, of not being judged on their race, of sharing. I mean, th there are texts, I, I have a number of them at the back of the comeback, of indigenous leaders talking about, well, since you're here and now you're part of the family, we'll have to share, but that means you have to share too, so everything that's ours is yours, but everything that's yours is ours. See, that's when we started breaking the treaties, because as long as we were getting stuff, we thought it was great, but then when they, their turn came, we said, oh, no, 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 you, you gave it all away, which is not at all, and the Supreme Court agrees, not at all what the treaty agreements were. They were agreements on sharing a totally non-European idea, I go back to the first line of my speech, a totally non-European idea of belonging and owning, replaced by an idea of sharing. So, in a way, it isn't accidental that, flawed though it is, we're the only Western country with a single-tier healthcare system. How do you, these things have, you have to believe in the collective unconscious, which should not be hard for this group, <laughs> right? Because if you believe in spirituality, you have to believe in the collective unconscious. So somehow we got ourselves to single-tier healthcare in spite of our neighbor to the south going the opposite way and the British and the French having two-tier healthcare. 
So how do we do that? I don't know how you, I don't even know how you intellectually do that argument, but we got ourselves there. And I could, you know, uh, um, uh, transfer payments. I mean, transfer payments, yeah, they have some, you know, Western intellectual roots in social democracy and so on. But fundamentally, when you look at where it came from, which is late 19th, early 20th century prairies, you realize that literally they were just, they had just finished a fair relationship with the Cree and the Ojibwe and the Métis people and were betraying it. But they had an idea of how you live together uh, with people. So we have this opportunity to reestablish these ideas of inclusion on purpose. I think spirituality plays a role in that. And I just would ask you to remember one thing in when you're talking about it. It goes back to your introduction of there are ideas, but there's also the practicalities of doing stuff. So you, if you come from uh, if you're United Church or Catholic or Anglican, you've apologized or more or less apologized for the horrors of the residential schools. And there has been some truth, and there have been this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which actually is the third big commission on indigenous issues in Canada. And so we have thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of information that were published, and they're all very well written. What's interesting about the Erasmus Commission is how beautifully written it is, and how totally public the texts are, if you just want to go and read it, uh, those who haven't. Um, but so we've, we've had quite a bit of truth, and we'll have more truth, and, um, we, um, and I think there's an acceptance of the idea of reconciliation without a large understanding of what that implies. And one of the reasons that there isn't a large understanding is because there can be no such thing as reconciliation without restitution. What does restitution mean? That's a long discussion. It does it mean that everybody uh, who isn't indigenous and lives in Ottawa has to give up their land. Nobody who's in, no indigenous person I know is asking for that. But you know, reconciliation without restitution is really cheap romanticism. You know? I mean, if, you know, you just start, just start with, forget about, the, for the moment, the treaty rights. Just look at human rights. Look at what's guaranteed to Canadian citizens. Clean water, proper sewage systems, proper schools, an equal amount of money spent on schooling for kids, or more money spent on kids with higher need. So, you know, uh, I had a, a younger brother who had handicaps. In those days, we did not look after those kids. Now we have quite a few schools that helps, that help. We spend more on that because they need more. Um, uh, to be a bilingual country, we need to spend more money. We spend more. Uh, uh, but we, you, 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 you know, new immigrant kids, they need language lessons. And we, we understood this, and it's something that, you know, the, that the Europeans are still struggling with. The first thing you do is spend money on language, multiple languages, to get, you know, help them get, get in, get going, etc. And then you turn to the indigenous kids, and you discover that not only are they not being given education funded at the same level as your kids or grandchildren, but they're being funded at a far lower level. When in fact, if you live in, 50% still live in isolated communities, we all know that if you live in an isolated community, you have to spend more than the average. It costs more to provide services and education. So that if, you know, an Ottawa kid is getting a dollar, just to take a number, uh, spent on them, you know, indigenous kids, people in isolated communities should probably have a dollar fifty spent in order to make it work. And instead of that, we're spending 75 cents, if that. So, I mean, that's racism, that's exclusion, that's a leftover of the old monolithic thing. And if you want to be serious about um, uh, reconciliation, you have to be serious about restitution. It, and it starts, it starts with the human rights end, so the, the water, the schools, the housing, the education, the energy. If we can't do that, we shouldn't even, we, we actually are being dishonest when we begin by acknowledging the land. Because that's the basis of fairness and justice, which is that, that we will spend, you know, it's practical, we will spend and organize and support what is necessary in order to assure a form of egalitarianism. If not, we're talking big 
and we're actually betraying that spirit of inclusion and egalitarianism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, well, a couple of questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, don't, don't worry. Unless it's, unless it's for exercise, just don't worry. <laughs> Uh, we, we have a few minutes for questions? Yeah, yeah, we do have 10 minutes. Yeah, so why don't we just go very quickly if anybody wants to say anything. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, for uh, obviously very uh, long, uh, remarks. Uh, I want to take you a little, little bit further about, uh, so being stuck in the Westphalian uh, idea and even mythology of the nation, the period, and so forth, I'd be interested in your commentary on how what seems to be almost the the, 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 the good reference of, of the uh, liberal politician, I mean liberal party, the, the, the politicians, now speak about nation to nation to nation dialogue. The, uh, I'm, I'm a professor at law at the University of Ottawa, and one of my colleagues, Larry Shutdown, has been working on uh, Métis treaties. He hosts a major conference on uh, uh, Métis communities, a very profound discussion amongst the uh, leaders of the community about what it is to be the maybe nation or nations and who is and who isn't and so forth. My concern and my question to you to comment on this is how this not reify precisely what you're critiquing? Or is there a risk to this uh, that, uh, uh, that there's a, a uh, divisive element in it, an essentialist element in it, which is also not honest in, in terms of the own historical roots, but also problematical in terms of going forward. So I think like your Well, I mean, that, obviously that's a really complicated question, but I think, I think it goes back to this question of, you know, we're still spending $125 million a year in the courts, right? The government. Um, we still have all these roots in place. And, 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 and here's almost the key point that you know, in 1960 or something, 55 or 60, it was still illegal for an indigenous person to hire a lawyer. And there were no indigenous lawyers as a direct result of that. And when they started, and this, this sort of modern Indian movement, as it was called from the beginning of the 20th century on, uh, started fighting back, they were essentially told, well, you better get yourself a lawyer. And then they were told, well, since you're doing so well in the courts, we're going to ban you from having lawyers. And then once they were allowed to have lawyers again, um, uh, basically, the, the government said, well, you know, see if you can beat us in court. So today, you've got, you went from basically zero, almost zero indigenous people in the universities and zero lawyers and zero doctors, almost. Um, now you've got about 2,500 indigenous lawyers and about three to 400 indigenous doctors. Now, you know, whose fault is that? Whose fault is it that the argument is about a, uh, a European word, nation? Whose fault is that? This is the insistence of the, the settlers, of the government of Canada, of the provincial governments. This is the way it's done. You, wanna, you want these things? Beat us in the courts. We could have had 2,500 indigenous doctors and 300 indigenous lawyers. You know? And, and so the, 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 the language issue of what is a nation, what is a nation state, what, you know, what is, what is sovereignty, all of these are being argued, uh, except by the Supreme Court, are being argued um, as if the definition of a nation, and you, you refer yourself back to Europe, the definition of a state, the definition of a nation state, the definition of people, and all of this is, you know, uh, the, the blame lies and the complexity lies entirely with the refusal of the established order to say, let's have a really interesting conversation about all of this. I mean, I sit down with, you know, in very, very interesting indigenous lawyers and professors all the time, and they say they just won't talk. They just want to have a case. You know, uh, Sakash Henderson, you probably know you know, who runs the uh, Indigenous Law Center at the University of Saskatchewan, I mean, Native Law Center. Uh, Sakaj, who's brilliant, would just say, you know, they just won't sit down and talk. And I've been in meetings, and you see them just trying to, you know, they, they won't engage in a proper discussion about what all this could look like and how all this could function. So if 
you're locked into a corner, which is, are you or are not you not a nation as defined in the 18th and 19th century in Europe, you, you defend your corner. And I certainly would do exactly the same thing. What the other possibilities are, you know, the overlapping loyalties, which in a, in a real conversation, they, indigenous people, you know, that's the way they act and think is, you know, multiple personality, multiple loyalties, multiple, you know, uh, you don't own the land, so the borders don't mean exactly that. So it was very interesting. I'll finish with this. So I just come from a fascinating meeting in Victoria, um, which was about uh, ethnobotany. Nancy Turner, I don't know if any of you know her, and indigenous philosophy. So Nancy and, and Richard Atlia, who I mentioned, were kind of the leaders. And um, uh, the, the night before it was opened, there's a wonderful First Peoples Hall at, I think it's called at University of Victoria, which is like one of the big open West Coast houses. And uh, uh, one of the chiefs, Adam Dick, uh, from the West Coast, uh, gave permission for um, one of the songs, one of his songs to be performed, which is very, very rare, you know, without going into the details of it. But what was, and it was a wonderful, it went on for an hour, and it was danced with masks and the whole thing. Very profound, very interesting on environmental issues. Uh, very few words. And, um, but what was fascinating was that as you listen to it that night and the next day, people talking about it, they move back and forth between words like, you know, Chief uh, Dick owns this song or has copyright over it, which of course is, don't you academics come near me and try and steal this from us. You know, they're using the language which is required by our system. But at certain points they would say, Chief Dick has authority over this song. You see, that's a completely different idea. That idea of authority, responsibility. You know, that I, I, I curate this song. This song is in my family. I, I don't, you're forcing me, they would say, you're forcing me to define this in copyright terms, because if I don't define it in copyright terms, you'll steal it from me. You will not respect the authority of my family. You will not respect our history. So that's, it's not exactly an answer, but I mean, that's where we're part way down this road. And the problem is that I don't think the law schools, they could, the law schools could be the place where the most interesting conversations took place. I think, I think the Supreme Court has opened the door wide on these issues with, you know, with Delgama, with the honor of the crown, with, you know, all, the, it's all there. Daniels, I mean, it's all there, uh, you know, if, um, we're start, and it really needs to be, there need to be really big conversations. We should have devoted this 150th anniversary of Confederation to an enormous public debate on things like this. That's what we should have focused on. And, you know, you know drop stuff about we're going to give you a patriotic, linear story of the history of Canada. And we put the natives in there, don't worry. You know, please. I mean, just let's have, every time we have a big uh, anniversary in Canada, we should make it a year of discussion and debate. I think. Yes, sorry. Who would like to? One more question. So by definition, it can't be a law professor. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to raise their hand? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very, very much. And I, I wish this recording is made available to every university professor um, uh, on every university campus. Because um, what I hear are um, very superficial discussions that are just emerging on university campuses around the issue of decolonizing our syllabi. And I'm not sure anybody has a clue what that means, other than some of my colleagues asking me to come and give a guest lecture in their classes. And I'm like, that does not decolonize your syllabus. <laughs> but I think uh, now that Couch, the Canadian Association of University Teachers has sort of put out this territorial acknowledgement for every university. Um, faculty is really struggling what that really means as they include that in their syllabi. Uh, most of them have no clue um, how to even explain that to their students. I mean, I've learned so much just from this lecture. That would put all of that in perspective as I, you know, appear in front of my students. But I think there needs to be a formal education process. Um, I'm part of a program that, um, at University of Waterloo where we have tried to decolonize some of it 
in the program that we have created, which is an interdisciplinary studies program called Studies in Islam, where we teach about the thousand years of philosophy and history that has gone missing called the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. So, but, but there needs to be more than that, right? I mean, the little guys can only do so much. Um, practically speaking, what would you offer um, as, as suggestions to universities? Uh, you know, in what ways do we incorporate and truly decolonize? Well, I mean, I think, th I think, that, that what, I think what you have to avoid doing is uh, slipping into, if you like, the shadow of the colonial, which is the classic European-American anti-colonial. Uh, that, that discourse of the, the, this and that and the enemy and the, um, simply leads back to the same place. There may be some progress in it, but it's, uh, so it is in a sense about people finding complicated ways through that are open. And so everything I said was about complexity and openness and understanding and, and, and uh, looking for other influences. And you, I think you have to, you, so that's the first thing. The second thing is there have to be big discussions in the universities about, well, okay, if this is unceded land, what does that mean? What could that mean? And so, you know, it, it does mean restitution, but restitution is not going to mean that everybody who's there walks away from the land because nobody's, nobody, no indigenous person is asking for that. So what are they asking for? And then that you have to have that discussion and figure out what that actually means. Uh, and one of the things that it clearly means is, um, is a rethinking of uh, what, what does an anthology of poetry look like? You know? what, does, um, what, does it, what, is a, what does a foundational course of philosophy look like? You know, I, I didn't say it today, but I mean, I often say time has come to, you know, let's start strategically. Where do you start universities? Department of Philosophy. What did you do? Blow it up. Get the people out first. But I mean, you know, blow it up. <laughs> and then there'll be rubble. And then you take the rubble, you sort it out, and then you say, okay, now what would be interesting to bring in here? Oh, gosh, there's some really interesting ideas out of Islam. Oh, say, look at those, you know, really interesting Asian ideas. Look at who, who you know, we, we have all these departments of um, uh, these business schools, which, you know, have, you've noticed, managed to create enormous growth, enormous shared wealth. I mean, a terrible failure, right? Um, uh, who is the greatest expert in the history of the world on the philosophy of management? Confucius. Who is, who is the greatest humanist philosopher of management and relationships between people. Confucius. Where is Confucius? Oh, we don't have time, but you could go and do a little course on Confucius over there. I'm terribly sorry. You want to talk about, you know, relationships between uh, uh, governing elites and the people, you cannot leave out Confucius from your uh, philosophy 101. You can't do it, you know? So, I mean, I think there needs to be a very serious, you know, and I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, I just was, uh, one of the last month I was president of Penn, I was in Mali, and there was this amazing meeting of, you know, there's half colonial, French-speaking West Africa writers, but most of whom spoke other languages, enormous languages, African languages, and, and you know, of course, one talks about the great empire of Mali, which is partly mythological, but guess what, all great Western Civilizations are based on myth also, so I don't see the problem there. And there is a fantastic text coming out of the Mali Empire. And I, I don't have it written down in front of me, and of course I can't remember. Um, and it, but it's basically, a, a, it's a little bit like the, the, the League of Virtue, which is, you know, what are the responsibilities of people to other people? How do people relate to each other? Uh, how are we going to work together? It's there. Is it in any of our philosophy courses? No. Why? Well, because we've got to do the French 18th century. Well, the French 18th century and the German and English 18th century led, the American, led to the, the invention of industrialized slavery, that is the single most important invention of Western civilization, industrialized slavery. Nobody ever managed to do it. At the opening of the American Civil War, you have to look it up, um, something like 60 or 70 percent of American exports were cotton. And that's without putting in sugar and tobacco and whatever else. 
So you would actually probably get to, let's say, 75% of American exports at the opening of the Civil War were based on slavery. Now, the counter argument to that is that in force in the North, there was enormous creation of new kinds of industrial activity which were not based in slavery and they weren't exporting. So the numbers are a bit false. But how false? 50-50? So, you know, this, is, this, this use, invention of and use of human beings as a commodity is, you know, this is really something, really, really something. So, so you know, uh, uh, when people say, well, we have to learn Immanuel Kant, we've got to learn, I say up to a point. I would actually think that there are other philosophical traditions which need to be built into our philosophy departments in order for us to say, well, you know, there's another way of doing this. There's a, there are other ways of thinking about this. I mean, do you know, you, you know, so I'm 69, and um, I could tell you, and everybody else here who's 69, or let's say 60, I'll, and I'll stop, 60 or over, we were taught or made to understand that while empires were over and had been unfortunate in many ways, nevertheless, they had presided over 50 to 70 years of peace until the First World War. That's a dominant argument. I mean, does, does anybody disagree with me? Right? And, you know, I just finished reading a book on the um, uh, uh, late genocides of the British Empire in India and China. I don't know if you've seen the book. It's an amazing book. And, you know, it's in two major droughts. Um, the British government and the Raj consciously decided that the way to fight the drought was to use a maximization of the free market because since people didn't have enough grain, because there's a drought, therefore the grain would go on the wonderful new railway systems towards the drought and people would be saved. In fact, the exact opposite happened, which was that there was nobody with any money in those areas and therefore the money, the grain, even in those areas, left to warehouses and the export of grain to Britain during this period of drought went through the roof. And, uh, you know, in one of them, between 10 and 20 million people died. In the other one, it's about 10 to 15 million people died. You know, so, I mean, you, you know, this is all based on the glory of the first wave of the Industrial Revolution. So you have to really think about what works, what did work, what didn't work. How could they have gone on for five years pretending that the free market was working? And in fact, last comment to be perfectly negative, um, <laughs> you know, last comment, which was I wrote in a number of books that, of course, that the German model of the prison camp, the death camp, although they took it to a level of, of, of rational organization we had never seen, right, with the Holocaust, um, and organization and uh, pre-computer use of the Holroyd counting machine to round people up and stuff. But the, the, the actual model was invented by the British in the, um, in the South African War with the prison camps where they put women and children, where I think the number is 50,000 women and children died in those camps. Right? This is not talked about a lot in Britain. And, but what's interesting is reading this more recent book about the two big droughts in, in India, which also, it was caused by whatever that wind is. Um, no. Anyway, the point is, the, the droughts were real. They didn't cause the droughts. It's the way they handled them. Um, uh, that, that, in fact, their, their reply to the failure of the free market was to set up what they called work camps. And these work camps were sort of a version of poorhouses in Britain, and the Dickensian poorhouses, the Dickens opposed. But in fact, they were a precursor of death camps because they um, separated the men from the women and the children. They paid them an amount of money which you could only die from because it was not enough. And yet there was nowhere else you were allowed to go. And the result was that the death levels in the camps were, I forget the numbers, they're just absolutely appalling. You were dying almost faster in the camps than outside of the camps. So, you know, when you teach philosophy, you have to teach the effect of the philosophy. I mean, and religions, you know, you, all the religions have to deal with the fact that when it goes wrong in a religion and there are wars of religion, you have to deal with, that is not an accident. That has happened, and it has to be dealt with philosophically and ethically and morally 
or else the religion cannot stand. Well, the same is true of philosophy, of all philosophy. Thank you very much.